And so we want to take a moment and just honor, uh, honor Reverend Armistead and uh, yes, Reverend Lord. Daphne. Yes. Amen. Yes. Amen. 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 It is good to appreciate those whom the Lord has given us right. to share in the building up of God's kingdom. And we want to let uh, our associates, our deacons, our trustees, and all of those, our deaconess, know that your service is not in vain. You just keep right on serving and see if the Lord will not bless you for what you do. Amen? Amen. I uh, have been given my marching orders, not only by your pastor, uh, but by uh, Deacon, uh, Deacon, Deacon Gentry. Uh, see, I almost did it again. I almost called you Deacon Dabney, but that's Reverend Dabney and Deacon Gentry. Amen. Amen. Let's give God praise for Deacon Gentry. She, Deacon Gentry, tough, ain't she? <laughs> Amen. Amen. I love her spirit. And we thank God for a new family. Uh, I'm in a place where I have not been before. And so, uh, but Pastor, amen. Thank you, D. Uh, I got another one, but Pastor told me to make myself at home. So I will uh, aim to do just that. I want to invite your attention uh, for the moments that are mine to uh, the 27th Psalm. If you can uh, turn with me there, the 27th Psalm. And um, if I could, and I, I, I don't know if we have the capability to do it, but if you can back up to verse 12, I want to take verses 12 through 14. I won't use all of that for uh, our scriptural text. I'll still use our key verses as verses uh, 13 and 14. But I'd like to invite your attention to Psalm 27. Psalm 27. And I will read verses 12 through 14. Uh, be reading this morning out of the King James Version of the Bible. Uh, I see you have the New King James there. It's, it's, it's perfectly fine. Uh, you can leave that there. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. It's all, it's all good. Yeah, it's, it's, it's all good. This is the word of the Lord. And uh, we thank God for that. Uh, it'll read just a, have just a little variance uh, from the uh, New King James that you see on your screen. But please follow along. It's the word of the Lord. Word of God reads, it says, deliver me not over unto the will of mine enemies, for false witnesses are risen or risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. Verse 13, I had fainted unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Wait on the Lord and be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. I want to use for a simple subject today, faith for a fixed fight. If you'll help me preach today. I just want to use for the moments of the mind with God's help and your prayers, faith for a fixed fight. I, um, I, I, I have to openly admit today that I have not, uh, at least not to my knowledge, ever witnessed what could be deemed as a fixed fight fight. Okay. Now, I know we are in the age of conspiracy theorists. And everything has a slant. Everything has an angle. Uh, in an age when we have uh, Google master's degrees and Google doctorates. You know, everybody's a scholar, right? But uh, I personally have not, at least not to my knowledge, witnessed a fixed fight. Now, for those of you all who are not familiar with the term, give me just a minute to settle down into this uh, to uh, give some context to what the term fixed fight is. The fixed fight is usually a fight where the outcome of the fight is already determined before the fight even starts. Now, uh, 
also along with that, this uh, the outcome of this particular fight that has already been determined before the fight even starts, usually uh, bound together by some sort of agreement before the fight. Uh, somebody got slipped a little bit of money. Somebody got a sweet deal on the outside to dupe the people who would be watching this fight and the fight has already been fixed. The winner has already been determined even before the fight starts. Now, since I have not been privy to a fixed fight, um, I realized that uh, I do like wrestling. I know, I'm 38 years old, but just, just, bear, just bear with me. Okay? <laughs> I, I, I like wrestling. I like wrestling. Now, don't 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 judge me. You know, I, I, I blame my grandfather. Uh, we watched it together. He was a he, he drove trucks for Crowley. And when he came home on the weekend, he would we would sit up there on that hill, on that brick house, and uh, on Saturday mornings we would watch WCW World Championship Wrestling. Yeah, they they used to they used to come on TV. And we used to watch uh, wrestlers like Nikita Koloff. Uh, uh, we used to watch. Uh, we used to watch uh, uh, the Road Warriors. We used to watch. Uh, who did we used to watch? Ric Flair. I didn't like. I didn't care too much for the Four Horsemen. Uh, we, we we used to watch Sting and all of those guys. And then we got over uh, to WWF, which is now WWE. And we used to watch uh, Jimmy Five Snuka. Uh, uh, one of my favorites, JYD Junkyard Dog. You know, representation matters. You know. <laughs> and uh, Coco Beware, y'all don't know about Coco Beware. Uh, we used to watch all of those guys and uh, I, I learned as I got older that what I was watching on TV, um, it was actually real. Now I know, I know you're saying we're well, real, now hold on, I was with you until you said wrestling was real. Well, give, give me just a minute and I'll prove it because what I learned is as I begin to grow, and as I begin to, you know, kind of follow uh, wrestling from a, at a cursory glance, I realized that there would be times on Monday nights that I would not see certain wrestlers. And I wondered why I did not see certain wrestlers. I didn't see certain wrestlers because these particular wrestlers were nursing real injuries. So, so how can something be fake if you really get hurt? Hurt hurts. And, and I, I recognize that although wrestling, uh, uh, although wrestling and people said that it was fake, it actually was not fake because people really got hurt, but it was scripted. Somebody said scripted. Now, scripted, scripted means that uh, it follows a certain procession uh, within the context of a storyline. So wrestling, uh, what, I, what I learned about wrestling is that it was very real, but it was fixed. It was scripted. They were waiting a certain amount of months until they could determine who the next champion would be. And I believe that David in the text permits us to eavesdrop on his personal professional and private life to give us context not only in our personal battles but ultimately in our ultimate victory. I, I, I wish today that you would just follow me along in this text. I'll try, I'll try not to be before you uh, too awfully long uh, but this particular text in Psalm 27 uh, there are three sweeping movements in the text that I think are noteworthy for you and I to follow today if we are going to have faith for a fixed fight. The first movement is a movement of salvation. This is a psalm of David, but it is a psalm of salvation. The, the second movement that you'll find in this text is a movement of deliverance. It is a movement of deliverance that takes a uh, place in our text today. And lastly, what we find in this text is a movement of victory. 
So we have first on deck a movement of salvation, second a movement of deliverance, lastly a movement of victory. This movement of salvation is headed off by none other than that first verse where David writes, the Lord is my light and he is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? But then he says that the Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even my enemies and my foes, came upon me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell. Though a host should encamp against me, my heart shall not fear. Though war should rise against me in this, will I be confident? One thing have I desired of the Lord, and that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in his temple, this movement of salvation that the psalmist is trying to get us to recognize uh, uh, as, a, as an issue of importance is based on none other than that first line that the presence of light equals the absence of darkness. In other words, David said, he was, he was uh, highlighting for us in this uh, movement of salvation that even though he found himself in a period in which he was fighting a battle, he realized that even in the darkest times of battle, that the Lord had the ability and the characteristic and nature of a light bearer. Uh, 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 this is detailed in none other than uh, the first book of the Bible in Genesis. When God was, uh, was uh, engaging in creation, he calls out into darkness and says, let there be Because if there is light, then there is illumination. If there is illumination, not only is there illumination, but there is revelation. And where there is revelation, there is understanding. Somebody say understanding. David, in essence, is suggesting to you and I that where the Lord is his light, that he is his salvation. Because uh, if the Lord is his light, then he is able to save him in the darkest of places in his life. Maybe I need to pause parenthetically and let somebody in Mount Carmel know that there is not a dark season that you can face in your life that the Lord will not shine his light in. I don't care where you are. I know you're saying, Red, I've been in some mighty dark places. As a matter of fact, I'm in a dark place right now. But I need to tell somebody that there's no dark place that you can find yourself that the Lord cannot shine his light on. David testified to this when he said, Whither can I go from your presence? If I see it up to heaven, you're there. If I go to hell, you're there. No matter where I go, I cannot get away from your presence because your presence bears the, the characteristic of light that not only does it save me, but it gives me hope for where I am. That's what we need in dark places. We don't necessarily need to have everything to line up together but is there anybody in here that knows that sometimes when you're in the heat of a, of a hot battle all you need is just a little ray of sunshine all you need is just a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel that will tell you that you can make it that can tell you that it's not over that can tell you that you're not finished that can tell you that you're not done that can tell you that the best is yet to come in your life It is the light of God's salvation. And that's why I can't, I, that's why I can't understand people who will come to church and won't clap their hands and won't say amen and just look mad the whole time. How can you be so mad when God has been so good? He woke you up this morning. You didn't deserve that breath. God gave it to you. You didn't deserve that breakfast. God saw fit for you to have food on your, who am I talking to in this room? I need to tell you that sometimes salvation to 
tells me that it's not the end of my story, but he, he talks and he says, not only that, but for in the time of trouble, he'll hide me. Y'all don't know nothing about being hidden in Mount Carmel, do you? Sometimes, sometimes I realize that God sometimes has to hide you from you. Uh, he says, in the time of trouble, y'all know about trouble, don't you? Uh, he said, he shall hide me, but, but that's, not, that's not the shouting part. The shouting part is where he hides you. He said, in his pavilion, in the secret place of his tabernacle, shall he hide me, and he shall set me up on a rock. Now, I like that because that means that not only is he going to give me a hiding place, but he's going to set me up on a rock, on a place where only he can find me. Sometimes you need to be hidden. Sometimes in a place where only God can find you. And I believe that I'm talking to somebody in Mount Carmel that you're wondering why I haven't been discovered. God, why haven't you done these things in my life? Well, God says sometimes I have to hide you until you are ready to walk in fully what I have for you because I can't trust you with what I have for you right now. So until you're ready, I gotta hide you. Sometimes we gotta thank God for being hidden. Because see, when sometimes when we think we're being hidden, uh, or when we are being, being hidden, sometimes we think we're being punished. But there's a big difference between punishment and protection. Sometimes we are not being punished by God when we are being hidden with God. We are being protected from the things that we're not ready to handle. And God says, I got to, I got to hide you. But here's the thing, here's the thing I want you to know. I'm not going to hide you in a place where the enemy going to find you. I'm going to hide you in a place where he can come but has no authority. You miss that. You miss that. See, because if you read Job, the book before, you will see that the devil tried Job, but he tried Job after he came in the presence of the Lord. See, the enemy can have access into the presence of the Lord, but the thing I love about the presence of the Lord is the enemy has no authority in the presence of the Lord. And I'm grateful that he might have access, but he doesn't have authority. That only belongs to one person, and I give God glory today because when he hid me, he hid me in a place where only God could reach me. And God could reach me at the time of my greatest need and my greatest for development, he said, and I'll pull you out when you're ready. Watch what he says. He says he's gonna hide me, and he shall set me up upon a rock. This is somewhat of a direct throwback to the time in which God appeared and passed by Moses in the cleft of the rock. Not only will he hide you in a place where only he can reach you. But he will put you in a position where he needs, where only he can show you certain aspects of himself. See, it wasn't until God positioned you in the place where you were that he was able to make himself manifest to you in the way that you needed him to. It wasn't until your money got a little low and your change got a little strange that you realized that he could be Jehovah Jireh. Your it wasn't until you got sick that you realized that he would be your healer. It wasn't until you needed a friend that you didn't know that he would be a comforter. But because you experienced what you did in the position where you were, God said, I revealed myself to you in the season of what you needed most. That's why, that's why you can't afford to get mad when God has you in odd predicaments. That's why you can't afford to get upset and say, God, why me? And start having a pity party for where you are. You need to say, God, I thank you. Because you must be trying to show me a different side of yourself than I've ever seen before. Because watch this, watch this. We will come to church and be just as comfortable as we can be. We'll do the same old thing, the same old way, at the same old time. But it's not until external forces begin to press on us. It's not until 
certain things begin to happen in our lives? Do we begin to get uncomfortable in our faith and we begin to pray in a new way and God positions us to receive a different side of him than we've ever seen? Not somebody real quick, and this is probably the last time I'm going to do it, but not somebody real quick and say, that's growth. Because see, God, here, here's, and maybe I'm going to give you this one for free and then I'm going to move on with the rest, okay? Sometimes God knows that if he never pushes us, we'll never grow. We will stay comfortable. We will keep on praying the same way and singing the same old song. We will praise with the same intensity. But have you ever went through some trouble and prayed in trouble? Is there anybody here that's ever had to pray your way out of trouble and watch God come through? You pray a little bit different when you're going through something. You give him glory a little bit different when you're dealing with some stuff. But he says, I'll hide you. And David testified, he said, and now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies. This is the deliverance portion of the text. Because he said, I've got enemies. The enemies were attempting to kill me. And God snatched me. You missed your shot. I said, you had before God snatched you. See, and some of us, our biggest enemy was ourselves. And we ought to thank God that God has the unique ability to separate who we are from whose we are. And God will save you even if he has to save you from yourself. But David said, and now shall my head be lifted up above my enemies. Round about me and I will offer in this tabernacle sacrifices of joy. I will sing, yea, I will sing praises unto the Lord. He says, hear, O Lord, when I cry with my voice. Have mercy also upon me and answer me. When thou says, seek ye my face, my heart said unto thee, thy face will I seek. So here's what I need you to do, God. Hide not your face. Anybody ever pray like that? Anybody ever prayed for God to show up in the midst of your circumstance, in the midst of your situation? Have you ever been so desperate for God to just peek his head into your situation, to just, to just step into where you were and let you know that you were not alone in what you faced? David said, hide not your face far from me and put not my servant away in anger. Thou hast been my help. Okay, I got to pause right there. I got to mess with that just a little while. Anybody know that God has been your help? See, here's what I love about God. When you truly love God, it shows. Because nobody has to tell you to praise him. Nobody has to tell you to say amen. Nobody has to tell you to say hallelujah or thank you, Jesus. Because the revelation built on your illumination is that he has been your help. Is there anybody here that knows that he's been your help? But we don't know that, and the text does not 
give us that, but what the text does say and what David, uh, what David is suggesting to us in the context of this particular text is that uh, there are times uh, uh, in this life uh, where your mother and father are going to have to leave you all by yourself. Uh, uh, I'm, a, I'm a PK, I'm a son of a pastor, uh, uh, and uh, my mom is, uh, my mother and father, they met in a community choir, and uh, they raised me in church, and all that good stuff, but I had to realize that I could not go where God wanted me to go based off of their relationship with God. I need to talk to somebody just for a little while. You got to build your own relationship with God. And what David defines and describes for us is that he has defined and built his own relationship with God. There are some times that even David was even speaking to a moment of death that even in death my, my mother and my father may forsake me but the Lord will take me up. To live, Paul said, is Christ and to die is gain. There is a heavenly reward even if I receive no earthly reward, great is my reward in heaven because I live faithful unto God. And I trusted him in the hard places, but that's the deliverance portion of this text. But lastly is the victorious movement of the text. Because David began to say, teach me thy way, O Lord, and lead me in a plain path because of my enemies. Verse 12, he said, deliver me not over unto the will of my enemies. For false witnesses are risen up against me, and such as breathe out cruelty. He says, he says, I, he says, I, I want you to, I want you to understand uh, that the reason, the reason why David is suggesting to us these moments uh, that if we are going to have faith for a fixed fight, we must understand that we cannot fear what the enemy is trying to do to us. I said, you cannot, you cannot fear what the enemy is attempting to do to you. He said, he said, if you teach me your way. <laughs> He said, he said, and lead me in a plain path of truth. He said that I know I'm going to be all right. Now watch what the text does. Because the text in verse 11, he's asking for God to teach him his way. In verse 12, he's telling him, he's telling, asking God not to deliver him over to the will of his enemies because there are false witnesses risen up against him. And there are, there is something that the enemy is suggesting that once David is caught, that they are going to do to him. All right. In other words, <clears throat> what David suggests to you and I today is that sometimes we have to learn the value in continuing to live despite of what the enemy is trying to do. That's right. That's right. I'm a shout on that all by myself. Ain't nobody happy in this room with me. So I'm going to say it one more time, and hopefully at least 12 of y'all will get happy with me. You have to learn the value in continuing to live despite what you know the enemy is trying to do to you. I said you have to learn the value in continuing to live despite what the enemy is trying to do to you. All right, David said, if you lead me in your plain path of truth, there are false witnesses risen up against me. Uh-oh. Y'all missed it. He said, the reason why I need you to help me, God, and I need you to lead me into truth is because there are false witnesses. David said, I don't even want you to take the false witnesses away. He said, I just want you to give me the strength to keep on walking. Because if you let me keep on walking, then I can outlive a lie. Somebody say, Lord, let me walk. Because see, the truth in faith for a fixed fight is the difference between you giving up and continuing to live. See, you can get shook because of an outcome that hasn't even happened yet and psych yourself right out of the will of God when God is trying to get you to at least stand in the ring 
to give me strength to keep on walking. Because people lying on me. But I know that if you give me strength, I'll outlive a lie. And after I outlive the lie, then what they are trying to do to me won't even matter. He said, they're, they're, he said as such as breathe out cruelty. Anybody in here ever been threatened? Anybody, anybody ever been actually, now I know y'all might not admit this, y'all can keep it real with me, but has there anybody that's ever received a threat and actually been afraid because of the threat? Maybe it was on your job, maybe it was somewhere else, wherever it was, David said the thought of the threat of the threat is actually frightening. He said the fact that I have to listen to people audibly threaten me and I know that I can't help but go through this. He said, if you leave me in your plain path, I know I'll be all right. But then, but then not only do you, do you not need to be afraid of what the enemy is trying to do to you, but lastly, but next you, you need to also keep your faith when you feel faint. The text, the text says, he said, uh, I had fainted. I like the way another version of the Bible reads, it says, I would have given up uh, unless I had believed to see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Watch it. You got to learn how to keep your faith when you feel faint. This word faint, it means to fall. This word faint, it means to render yourself useless. He said, I actually contemplated giving up after all the Lord has done and performed in my life. I actually let what the enemy was saying almost make me want to quit. He said the only thing that kept me from not quitting is that I believed. I can stop right there and preach on my own. I believed. See, your belief will get you out of trouble when you feel like giving up. Is there anybody here that's ever had to believe in yourself and believe in your God against all odds? I'm talking to somebody in this room and I came all the way from Lexington, Kentucky to Richmond, Virginia after Second Street Festival to tell somebody in the room that you've got to believe even when the odds are against you that God is going to give some glory out of what you face. Why do you think that the car accident 
If there are those in charge of coming as we extend the altar appeal, I want them to come at this moment.